Let's speak about the Arab Spring. Dr. Kedar, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gil. And I also thank you very much the rabbi, Gary Oren, Gary Oren who is behind uh, this program. And of course, I thank uh, Nurit Gringer to bring me here. And a very good friend, Adi Brobrial, who is here. Uh, he is one of the members of the Copt community here in, in the uh, West Coast. And I especially thank you guys, ladies and gentlemen, for coming, uh, maybe listening as well. <laughs> Not sure. It started with uh, hopes for democracy. Even uh, the most prominent commentator about the Middle East of the New York Times was standing in the Tahrir uh, Square and was overwhelmed with a stream of people who are shouting to democracy and he was sure that democracy comes to the Middle East. We know what democracy is because we, both in the United States and in Israel, we live in a democratic society. We actually, or I, I think that most of us, have never experienced living in another system. If I am correct, maybe those who came from ex-Soviet Union or ran away from some dictatorship like uh, Romania as it was under Ceausescu or Yugoslavia under Tito, not to mention uh, the Arab world. But most of us do not know about any, what, it, what it is to live under different system. This is why when something uh, changes, immediately they think that, oh, this is going to be democracy. What else? <laughs> what else is it going to be? There is no other system but democracy. So evidently, this is going to be democracy. And this is actually what uh, uh, what's the wave of enthusiasm about what happened? I'm talking about uh, three years ago in the Middle East. Uh, when you when you listen to commentators, especially from the Western world. However, we know about another system of uh, countries uh, which uh, are not democratic, and I'm talking about the ex-Soviet Union. Ex-Soviet Union was a very a giant uh, country, giant state, uh, which fell apart in the end of uh, the 90s to some 10 um, ethnic states. There is Russia today, and from the Soviet Union what we have today is Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Armenia, Armenia, Ukraine, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Okay, all these countries which are all ethnic states. Every one of them, Kazakhstan is the state of the Kazakhs. And the Armenians, and, and the Armenians have Armenia. And, the, and Belarus is an ethnic group which defines itself as ethnic of, of the uh, uh, Belarus. So, uh, what we found out when the Soviet Union fell apart is that ethnicity, which was covered through 70 years of the Soviet Union, actually remained alive. Although uh, one of the most important uh, slogans of the Soviet Union was fraternity of peoples, of nations, all these under the uh, red flag. We saw the same phenomenon in Yugoslavia, which was also a conglomerate of, of ethnic groups like Serbs and Croats and Bosnians with a bloodbath uh, in, during the 90s. Now there are seven ethnic states 
which today exist very peacefully, very nice, very, very stable states. Nobody fights with anybody else, especially these days, because every one of them reached a situation where it lives by itself, every ethnic group, and it deals with its own issues. Czechoslovakia, of course, Czechoslovakia was not a mayhem, but it divided itself with an agreement between the Czechs and the Slovaks, and now the Czechs have the Czech Republic, and the Slovaks have the Slovak Republic, and everybody is satisfied, everybody ha is happy. So what do I draw, what, do, what conclusion I draw from these three examples, Soviet, ex-Soviet Union, ex-Yugoslavia, and ex-Czechoslovakia, that ethnicity, even in Europe, is alive and kicking. And when peoples are given the uh, opportunity, they, they would like to live in an ethnic state, what, what, the, what we know is a nation state. Look at uh, Belgium. Belgium is always on the edge of being divided between the Flems and the Valons. The Flems who speak uh, uh, Dutch and the Valons who speak French. They don't mingle with each other. And uh, if one day they divide uh, Belgium, it will be a natural process. Scotland already announced that they are willing to vote in a referendum uh, about, I, I think it will be the, the end of this year, uh, whether to remain in the United, tell me United Kingdom, you know, with the Welsh and the Irish, very united kingdom, and uh, also uh, um, uh, in, in Spain there are all kinds of uh, cracks in the unity of, uh, of Spain. So in Europe we can very easily see that under the European Union, means the currency, standards of production and so forth, ethnicity is still alive and people want to live in their own nation state. The Arab world, or the modern Arab world, is a group of states. Most of them are a combination, combination of dictatorships and conglomerates, like the, so like the ex-Soviet Union. I'm talking about if I go from the east to the west, start with Afghanistan, continue to Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan to a large extent, uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia in its way, um, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia less, but Morocco big time. All these countries are conglomerates of ethnic groups, tribes, religions, and sects. What do I mean? Ethnic groups, let's say Iraq, has Kurds in the north, Arabs and Turkmens and Persians in the south. Different languages, different mindset, different rules, different clothing, different everything. Like Japanese and Romanians, different. Okay, so the same are Kurds and Arabs. Unfortunately, between Kurds and Arabs, they actually even hate each other uh, because of various reasons. And we do remember uh, the constant war between the central regime or central government in Iraq during the 60s and the 70s between the central government and, and the Kurdish uh, dist district of Iraq. We might remember names like Mullah Mustafa al-Barazani and Jalal Talabani who led the rebellion against the central government, supported by Iran of those days. So within one state, we saw for decades bloodshed, tremendous bloodshed between the government and its citizens. Why? Because, because they are not the same ethnic group. Iraq is divided to 74 uh, tribes. And tribalism in the Middle East is not only alive and kicking, it is alive and killing. Because every tribe, especially in places like Iraq, Libya, uh, Algeria, 
Syria, of course. Every tribe, first of all, it's a family of uh, like some dozens of thousands of hun or hundreds of thousands of people who live in one place for centuries. And they develop their own dialect, mindset, uh, rules, leadership. Um, and their rules are usually contradictory to the state, to the state rules. I'll give you the good, two good examples. Uh, the tribe is actually based on loyalty. That everybody, the cousin, because everybody is a family. So everybody is loyal to everybody in the family. Imagine that somebody, let's say, killed somebody from another tribe. So all his tribe are supposed to hide him. So the government will not come and put him in jail or kill him. Because this is what, the, this is what the loyalty means. So according to the tribe law, if you hide a killer from your tribe, you are a hero. According to the state law, you are a par partner in crime. Especially if you know that he killed somebody. How can you bridge between the tribe law and the state law? Another good example, according to the tribe, to the tribe law, the dignity of the tribe or the honor of the tribe is the, is the most important asset which the, which the tribe has. If, uh, let's say, 25 years old uh, lady, married or not married, allows herself to behave in a too liberal way with boys, according to the state, to the state usually, a, a lady in such an age has a freedom to do whatever she likes, with whoever she likes, whenever she likes, because she's a grown-up. According to the tribe law, if she inflicts shame on the tribe, her punishment is what they call in Arabic ras al ar means washing the, the, the shame with her blood. Okay? So how can you compromise between the state law which grants the lady freedom and the tribe law which takes the whole freedom away from her? So you cannot find the compromise because this is why the state always is viewed as the enemy of the tribe of the local tribe. So Iraq is fragmented to 74 tribes. And this is the main problem in this, this unfortunate country. The same thing with, with uh, Afghanistan, with 11 ethnic groups divided to who knows how many tribes. So Af uh, Pakistan with four ethnic groups, Sindhis, Punjabis, Baluchis, and Pashtunis. And so it goes all over the Middle East, conglomerates of tribes and ethnic groups, Berbers in, in North Africa, Nubis in Egypt and others. However, when we come to religion, the picture is much more complicated. In the Middle East, we have more or less 10 religions. They have two different religions, uh, 10 different religions. The most important is Islam, of course, means the most prevailing. We have Christians, Jews, not only in Israel, also in the Arab world, at least traditionally. Um, Sabais, Mandais, Alawis, Baha'is, Zoroastrians, Yazidis, and some more religions. Most of them, of those little religions which rarely we hear about them, if at all, uh, are viewed by Muslims as infidels. Those who believe in these uh, 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 religions, especially the Alawis in Syria. They are idol worshippers. And according to Islam, at least the radical interpretation of Islam, uh, once somebody uh, is caught worshipping idol, his fate is to be shortened by head or converted to, to Islam. This is the choice, no other choice. So. Uh, religions might be uh, very problematic in the Middle East, especially when one religion sees the other religions as illegitimate to a degree that the adherence to those religions uh, are supposed to be shortened by head. Uh, and the subdivision of religions are sects. The Islamic uh, uh, um, uh, societies are divided between Sunnis and Shiites and the Salafis and Sufis and all kinds of others. Hi. 
And um, um, Christians are also some uh, denominations in the Middle East. We have Copts in, in Egypt. We have, uh, um, we have uh, Assyrians, we have uh, Nest Nest Nestorians, uh, we have uh, Greek Orthodox, we have Roman Orthodox, uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, of churches in, in, in the Middle East. Some of them are Catholic, some of them are Orthodox, some of them are Protestant. So uh, also the Christian dome is being divided in the Middle East. And, uh, and, and also uh, the, the, the Yazidis are divided to two sects, never mind. But so this is another division. So the states in the Middle East, which we mentioned, are actually, every one of them is a conglomerate of ethnic groups, tribes, religions, and sects. The British and the French and the Italians, when they marked the borders of these countries, when they were the mandatories, hoped that one day they all will sit around one fire and sing Kumbaya together. <laughs> it never happened. It doesn't happen. And according to my uh, uh, assessment, uh, a very long time will pass until it starts to happen. Why? And this is what people here find it hard to understand. This country was established by individuals who came to this country as refugees or immigrants. They or their father, their, their, their parents or their grandparents. And they came, or everyone who came to this country came to be American. Not to remain Pashtun in America, not to remain uh, something else in America, but to be an American. And to share with the other American fellows the American dream of life, of liberty, and together to pursue happiness. They live wherever they lived, they send the children to the same school, and you can very easily see in the school who's, uh, wh wh where the parents came from. This one, his parents are Afro-Americans. This one, his parents are, parents are Chinese or Japanese or Russians or uh, from South America. From all the, all the world, people came here. Second generation went to school together. They had the same English almost. Got married with each other. Third generation doesn't even remember where the grandfather came to this country. Means that the melting pot maybe didn't uh, do a perfect job, but definitely did a very good job. And if not the third generation, fourth generation. And you see the, the outcome in this country. People think that uh, it is very easy, if, if it works here, that Africans will live with Europeans, Muslims with Christians, Jews with everybody. So this is because it happens here in this country. What's wrong with those people in the Middle East that it doesn't happen there? Why should the Sunnis kill the Shiites? Why the, why the uh, Muslims persecute the Christians? Why, it works here, it should work there. Why doesn't it work there? And this big difference between here and there. Here we are talking about a society which is built by individuals. And when you come to, to the individual, for individual to adopt a different culture, it's easy. His son, if he goes to public school, will be in another culture. His language will be different. Because the father still speaks English with an accent from where he came from. But the son and the daughter are speaking already English, which they learned in school. And the grandson doesn't even understand the, the language of the grandfather. Okay? This is what I mean, being together. In the Middle East, since we talk about groups, big groups, which live on the same place for generations, no, centuries, if not millennia, why should they change? They speak the same language, they have the same mindset, they have their laws. You know, you can take a U-turn with a little car. You cannot take a U-turn with a train. <laughs> No, this, this is the issue. You can, change, you can change the culture of a person if you 
force him or make him send his son to the same public school with another, with another somebody uh, who, is, who came from another country. Together they will have another culture, the second generation. But when you have a group of people who, let's say, Los Angeles, everybody speaks a language nobody understands. <laughs> Imagine. And everybody here is a, is, a, is a cousin, second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin of everybody else. Uh, daughters are married off inside Los Angeles because you will not, not let anybody uh, have your daughters because they are not from the same tribe. And, uh, ah, and, and Los Angeles has an army to deter the American government from uh, imposing its laws on Los Angeles. Okay, and the, and the local and, and the local um, what you call it? The, the local militia is armed to its teeth, mainly in order to defend the oil sources of Los Angeles, because Los Angeles sells the oil by itself, takes the revenues to itself, and doesn't share the revenues of the of the of the oil with the central government. Okay. By the way, this is exactly the situation in the Kurdish district today in Iraq. They take the oil from Iraq, from Mosul and Kirkuk, they sell it by themselves, and they don't show even one penny to the central government. Why? Because, because they can. Because they have an army, the Peshmerga, and the Peshmerga is much more powerful than the Iraqi army, and the worst is that the Kurds have no sense of humor. <laughs> and the Arabs are very careful when they talk to the Kurds. <laughs> As we say, they have derech heretz to them. How do you say derech heretz? They respect. They respect the Kurds, because the Kurds never forgot what the Arabs did to them, and never forgave for what the Arabs did to them. And they are waiting for the minute which they will be able to take revenge. And they have patience. You know, in the Quran, there is a verse which says, in Allah ma'asabirin, Allah is with those who have patience. So they have time and patience. So when it comes to groups, groups who live in one place and have their interests and leadership and fighting militia, to start changing their culture is a very, very hard mission. Because you have to convince them, no, maybe to force them to send their kids to another place where they can learn another culture, speak another language, meet other people, change their mindset, come home with another new agenda. Who will let you do this in a place like Los Angeles with its fighting militia? Okay, this is why in the Middle East when you come to change culture, it is very hard because you never face one person or individual, or people who are individuals. You are always facing a group. Either it's a religious group, like Muslims or others, either, or it is an ethnic group which lives in a, in a certain place and is very determined to keep and preserve its culture, or a tribe, or a sect, or whatever. And this is the problem in the Middle East which people here cannot understand or find it hard to understand, because America works according to another rule of individualism, which doesn't exist in the Middle East or exist in the margin. The Arab Spring came in the, in the end of 2010, when people started to be angry or too angry at those countries or those regimes who control these countries. Why? These countries, I'm talking about Syria, Egypt also, but Egypt is a, different, a sl slightly different case. But I'm talking Libya, Yemen. These tribal states, which are like conglomerates, were all controlled by one minority, which took over the whole country. In Yemen, it was the tribe of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. In Libya, it was the tribe of uh, Gaddafi, who took power in the end of 1969. 42, day, for 42 years, he sat in the same rag. 
Uh, and Kazafi, by the way, he, his name is very interesting. Kazafi is a, an adjective on the name of the tribe, like uh, Tel Avivi, which is somebody who lives in Tel Aviv. Uh, Haifai, somebody who lives in Haifa, okay? So the same thing in Arabic, Kazafi. So his name was Kazaf, but it was the half of the name. The real name of his tribe was Kazaf Eddam, which in Arabic is somebody who spritzes blood <laughs> or sheds blood. <coughs> not, his, not his own. <laughs> the others. And according to the stories in Libya, they got their name for a reason. Because this is how they treated others. So, uh, no wonder. This man was very innovative in finding ways how to get rid of his uh, opponents. Like throwing them from aeroplanes into the Mediterranean Sea, like throwing them into uh, big uh, cans or uh, containers, containers of, uh, of uh, acid. Well, the thing, atrocities like this, this was Gaddafi. This is how he could control the, his, his, his people. 160 tribes are in, 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 in Libya only. Uh, Saddam Hussein with his methods, and uh, also it was a minority of the Dulaimis, one small tribe in Iraq. And in Syria, the Alawis took power or by, by force in a series of uh, revolutions, started in 1966 when Salah Jadid came to power, then Assad in 1970. And the Alawis in Syria, although they are a minority, which is more or less 10% of the population. But their problem is not that they are a minority which does not have the legitimacy to rule because they are a minority. Their real problem is that they are infidels, idol worshippers, who, according to Islam, have the choice between converting to Islam or being shot in my head. And this is the problem of the, of the regime in Syria. Because the regime is, as we say in Hebrew, Ben Mavet. Should be killed because they are infidels. And this is the core problem of the legitimacy of the uh, uh, regime in Syria. I dedicated the whole, uh, my, my PhD and then a whole book to the, to the methods which this regime in Syria uh, developed in order to create legitimacy from scratch. Uh, you can read it, this is in, in simple English. Uh, Assad in search of legitimacy, message and rhetoric as, uh, as Gil uh, mentioned. Um, and you can see how innovative this uh, regime was in creating methods to uh, uh, to create legitimacy. And the more it tried, the more it failed. Because the people knew exactly who they are, what they are, and the more the regime's uh, 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 attempt or, or tried to convince the people to accept the regime as a legitimate regime, the failure was even bigger. And this was the problem. And Assad, father and son, were going in the world with a three-part uh, a, a jacket or suit with a necktie, and he was a eye doctor, you know, and everybody relates to him as if, as if he is like an, any other president of any other state. Nobody understood that those years when he was walking around in all kinds of corridors with, uh, with other uh, uh, leaders in the world, he was the last leader with, with, with legitimacy. Who, who, who thought about it? Uh, so these countries, I would say, were or could be compared to a barrel of explosives. Something which very, I would say, genetic problems. The fact that the state is a conglomerate of groups which never live in peace with each other, and they live in peace only because they are controlled by a dictator who is illegitimate because he represents a minority, especially in the Syrian case, a minority with no right to live even. This barrel of explosives uh, would be steady, would be stable, uh, unless a phenomenon started in 1996. At the end of that year, 
the Emirate of Qatar uh, started to broadcast uh, with a um, satellite, the channel Al Jazeera. Until that day, Arabs were exposed only to state media, which broadcast in radio, newspapers, of course, but radio, and UHF and VHF TV uh, channels. And UHF, VHF, you can control very easily because the range of broadcast is 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, not more. So if the government uh, broadcast, nobody can, can uh, intercept from other places because they are remote. But when you start uh, uh, broadcasting TV with DISH, with a, with a satellite, you can cross uh, continents with, 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 with a signal because you, 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 you broadcast to a satellite, it, it broadcasts back to the, to the Earth, uh, to another continent. So the, the distances now became much shorter, and an emirate like Qatar could broadcast to the whole Arab world. And they had a very, speci very special agenda. The agenda of Al Jazeera from the beginning was media jihad against the regimes, against the dictators, media jihad against America, against Israel, against the West and Westernism, means the culture of the West, and promoting the cause of the Muslim Brotherhood. This was Al Jazeera from the beginning. And every news broadcast, every program, every debate program uh, we, for women, for whatever, maybe not the weather, but everything else was Everything else was designed to work according to this agenda against Israel, the dictators, America, Western and Western Westernism, and to promote the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, I, what the, I, I'll give you a good example about what is it to be against the dictators. You know, and Mubarak and Assad and others were renewing their presidency every four or five years by a referendum in which they were the only uh, uh, candidate, and they always won by 99%, <laughs> more or less. Okay? So Al Jazeera used to call them the rulers of 99% under the zero. <laughs> As if there is such a thing. Oh, but because they have no legitimacy at all, and those 99% actually doesn't reflect anything. Okay, so this is one of the mild uh, expressions by which they uh, try to denigrate and to bash those dictators. Of course, they also uh, exposed of all kinds of uh, shaming things which they were doing, like stealing money from the peoples, um, uh, fooling around with girls, and so forth. So forth. I would say that Al Jazeera, since 1996, because of this propaganda, especially against the, the rulers, uh, surrounded this barrel of explosives with gas fumes. With gas fumes. Because of this incitement against those rulers. All it needed was a spark. And the spark came from Tunisia, by chance. When a, when a young man named Mohammed Bouazizi, in December, 2010, set fire in his own clothes because he was slammed by, by a po police woman, or maybe this, maybe not. I, I, there are all kinds of, uh, of, of stories about why did he do this. And he burnt himself and burnt the whole Arab countries, all those countries which were. And this is actually what happened there. Because immediately Al Jazeera started to bring his picture with a, with a fire, and demonstrations in his town, uh, Sidi Bouzid, which st started because of his, his uh, injury, that later he, he died, like two or three weeks later, and the, uh, the demonstrations spread to Tunis, to the capital of Tunisia, and people were demanding uh, that uh, the, the Ben Ali will run away, will leave them alone, after 23 years of a more or less democratic dictatorship, and uh, they, they know how to do this. And um, uh, he actually ran away. And when he ran away, after like almost a month of demonstrations, 
Of course, he took on the way like a ton and a half of, uh, of gold from the central bank. He also, was also a robber, not also. No. And uh, with his wife, of course. And he went to Saudi Arabia with his pension in the airplane. Big pension, a ton and a half of, of uh, gold. And since that minute, when he left, uh, Al Jazeera started asking on air, who is the next? Which country is the next? One day later, it started in, e in Egypt, and then in Libya, and in Bahrain, and Yemen. And in, in March, like uh, two months later, it started in Syria. And in Syria, the flames are still, until this very day, only recently, like two, three, three days ago, we found um, tremendous uh, pictures which, uh, of people who were tortured by, by, by the regime. Uh, I was not surprised because this is how this regime acts since it came to power in 1966. But uh, in 1966, they didn't have cell phones to take pictures. Now they have. So there's a whole difference. So, uh, uh, so this is actually what happened. These countries now are burning uh, because of many years of dictatorships, and the people actually want to end with two things. One is the dictatorship, the rulers who control them with vicious methods, like, like, like Saddam Hussein, like, like Gaddafi, like Assad and the others. And they also want to get rid of the borders which the colonialists drew around them, merging together groups which never became or never turned into one nation. This is why what we see today, that Iraq is already divided between a Kurdish state in the north. Of course, they didn't uh, uh, declare state to those Kurds in the north, but the Iraqi Kurdistan is an independent state uh, totally. They have their own government. They have their own army. Army. And you don't mess with them. Uh, they have borders which they drew because they like those borders. <laughs> they, uh, well, they drew the borders with some cle ethnic cleansing. They kicked out uh, some hundreds of thousands of Arabs who settled in Mosul. Of course, this was when they settled in Mosul, they ethnically cleansed the place from Kurds. Okay, so now the Kurds uh, are doing the same thing to the other direction. Okay, as I told you, they never forget and they never forgive. So, uh, so they have already the borders and they have their economy. They sell their own, uh, their own oil. And they have parties, they have mass media. And they even once approached me to be the commentator about Israel uh, in their, one of their channels. I said, hey, I, I don't speak Kurdish. So I said, no, 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 you can speak in Arabic. Everybody was forced to learn Arabic in, in, in Kurdistan. Okay, maybe now they don't. They are not uh, forced to learn Arabic, but uh, I couldn't. So, so, so they do whatever they like, and they actually seek relations with Israel. They have nothing against Israel. They still remember the days when Israel helped them against the, 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 the Iraqi regime until 1975 when Israel was forced to leave the, the Kurdistan because of the peace which was signed between the Shah and the Iraqi, the Iraqi regime. So part of this peace was that Iran will not let any more Israel uh, um, uh, go through Iran to the Kurdish district of Iraq. So they remember who helped them, uh, like Israel, and they definitely would sign to more uh, peace agreement, not uh, mutual uh, relations with Israel, if they only could. Uh, part of the tribes of Iraq already announced that they are forging states, like, like here. Means uh, autonomy, but not full independence uh, from the central government, because the central government does, doesn't function. Sudan was officially divided between the northern part of Sudan with the capital Khartoum and the southern Sudan with the capital Juba, which witnessed uh, some thousands of people killed in, 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 in battles uh, during the, the last month or two months ago. And um, uh, so it's officially divided. And every part of Sudan, the north and the, the northern and the southern, keep fighting internally 
in the north between the government and Darfur, which demands independence, and in the south, um, the Dinka tribes who shape the government uh, have not yet succeeded to spread the hegemony over the other tribes who demand independence. So it will continue maybe to be divided, these two parts of, uh, of Sudan, like I would say the same phenomenon as Ameba, which in, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm talking about, uh, this, 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 is the, this is the phenomenon. Because don't forget that originally Sudan was a state of 600 tribes, no less. In the north, uh, Muslims, in the south, Christians and animists, so they never had anything together except for a vicious fight for freedom. You know, in, in Sudan there was a war for like 50 years between the north and the south. Some two million people were killed. Who heard about this? Who knows about this? Who cares that Arabs kill Arabs? Okay? Human rights, yeah. Um, <coughs> Libya. Libya is falling apart. Uh, people talk today about uh, three states which might emerge because of the, uh, on the, uh, from the ruins of uh, Libya. Uh, they talk about Tripolitania in the west, Cyrenaica in the east, like uh, Benghazi, and uh, maybe in the south, uh, some, in another state for the Berbers who live, or the majority, of the southern part of, uh, of uh, Libya. Yemen, which was united at the beginning of the, of the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, now people in Yemen demonstrate in order to resume the independence of the southern part of, uh, of Yemen. Means to renew the division between northern Yemen and the southern Yemen. When you look at the Palestinian Authority, for example, you can also see how Gaza became a state six, uh, six and a half years ago under the rule of uh, Hamas, whether we like it or not, but it is a, a state. They have their border, government, uh, army, uh, police, military uh, industry, um, you know, whatever a star, uh, country or state needs, they have. Excuse me? Edu everything they have, even education against us. So, so, def so, no, no. I might, I might not like what happens there, but if I have to, 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 to ask my, myself, is this a state or not? The, the answer is yes. Why? All the uh, characteristics of a state, you can see it very clearly in in, in Gaza, and nobody uh, fights there against the regime. Uh, of course, they have here and there some jihadists, but it's not like in, in Iraq, which is a dysfunctional state. Uh, Hamas are functioning very well. So when you, uh, in Syria, of course, because of the war, the Kurds already in the northeast part of, uh, of uh, Syria actually function like their brothers in Iraq. They have their own district, their own state, uh, their own governing uh, group of uh, politicians. They have parties, they have their own, and, and they will never, read my lips, they will never return to live under the rule of Arabs, as they did until uh, the Arab Spring sprang. Um, uh, the Alawis in Syria, if they will be willing to keep their heads connected to their shoulders, they will have to run away to their mountains where, where they live traditionally and make a state there and to defend it. Otherwise, the Islamists and the Al-Qaeda will come and slaughter them because that's what, what, that's what they believe that it should happen. The Druze in the south, which is a different religion, different tribe, um, still fantasize on renewing their independence, which was denied from them by the French when the French forced them by, by their army to join Syria in 1925. They still dream about being left alone and to run their own business by themselves. By themselves. 
So, uh, uh, definitely Syria. Uh, Assad might, might, might remain in some enclaves, maybe in Damascus, maybe in the Alawi uh, district, maybe both, maybe, in, I don't know. But uh, he, will, he might stay. But uh, I don't believe that uh, today the majority of the, of the country is ruled by others, especially the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, Daesh as they call it in Arabic. And today there is an Islamic State in the northern districts of Syria, Raqqa and Khalab. This is why they keep uh, uh, bombing Khalab with barrels full of explosives. Uh, and, uh, and there is already an, another state, the Islamic State, which is functioning in the northern part of, uh, uh, of Syria. We, again, we might not like them because they are Al-Qaeda-like country, but they live there, they function there, and it is very hard to oust them. Assad will tell you it is not so easy. In Iraq, uh, the western districts are also have uh, some enclaves of uh, jihadists, of Al-Qaeda-like, uh, organizations, Sinai, the same thing. Uh, Egypt doesn't control Sinai. In Libya, there are some enclaves of Islamists who um, are more or less uh, Al-Qaeda-like uh, people. And you can add to this what happened in Mali half a year ago when France was forced to intervene in what happens there because of some jihadists. Uh, Somalia, big time with Islamists. Um, uh, uh, what you call it? N Nigeria, the northern districts already run, are run by Sharia law. They burn churches, they spill in the streets all the alcohol which uh, Christians uh, have in their stores. And uh, definitely you can see uh, uh, Islamic states or Islamic entities uh, emerge when lawlessness actually take o takes over. So this is actually what we are seeing today, that under the, the idea of democracy, we start seeing states being fragmented, uh, like the Soviet Union, or Yugoslavia, or uh, 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 Czechoslovakia, on one side. And what, we, what you have uh, inside of those states is either stable states or stable a, a homogeneous states, like the Druze, which will be in Syria, like the Kurds in northern Iraq, like the Kurds in northern Syria, all these ethnic uh, groups which came to, its, to their independence, just like the Kazakhis and the Uzbekis and the, the, uh, and the uh, Armenians in, in ex-Soviet Union, the same phenomenon, and some of them become Islamist uh, because uh, people uh, came there and established Islamic states. So, uh, to say that it will be democracy, I'm at all not sure. Uh, stable groups like, like Kurds can very possibly establish states or run their states with more or less democratic uh, means. And you know, it takes time until a society becomes totally democratic, like it is in, in here, mainly because they didn't go through the fragmentation to individuals as the society in this country uh, went through. They are still living groups, yet with the time they might uh, uh, also uh, become more, let's say, more humane, more, more democratic. To achieve democracy, it will take a long time. Iran will fall apart, no doubt. I have absolutely no doubt. When the regime will collapse, Iran will fall apart too. A Persian state in the center, Azeri in the, in the, in the, uh, in the north, Kurd, Kurdish state in the northwest, Baluchi in the south 